Hi everyone, I'm Rachel Braithen. I'm here in beautiful Costa Rica right now and I hope you're having a beautiful day wherever you are. I am so excited for the release of my new book, Yoga Girl. It's coming out super, super soon. I'll be available in stores all across North America and I am beyond excited for you all to be able to read it. It's been a year of creating this book and I have such an amazing time finding inspiration and to share my love for yoga with all of you. Whether or not you've been practicing yoga for a long time or if you're brand new to the practice, this will be a great book for you and I can't wait to hear what you all think. out on tour all across North America beginning at the end of March ending at the end of May. So I'll be going to a bunch of different cities for book signings, yoga classes and yoga events and I really hope I get to see some of you over there. having a lovely day and I hope I get to see you soon. Bye. Oh, wonderful. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. So I get to ask you questions. Where do I start? <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been burning up the city this week. How, how are you doing? I'm still very ecstatic to be here. Everybody's so positive and so happy. Um, I'm getting a little tired, but <laughs> we have four days to go in New York. And that's one of the things that I love about you is um, even though you have this beautiful, happy, lovely life, you're still incredibly real. And I think that's why you have so many followers is you're not pretending. Um, for everything to be all flowers, but then you still find the love behind the chaos. Um, how are you dealing with burnout? That's one of my questions. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I've been home 13 days this year, and I know that you have a very similar um, tour schedule, and don't spend much time at home in your beautiful Aruba. How are you dealing with that? I've learned since last year how to schedule in time to be off, which is something that took me a few years to realize. Last year I spent um, 40 weeks traveling out of the year, and uh, at the end of the year I was just completely done. And I realize now for this year, you know, we have this book release, and I didn't know because I'm a first time author, but every time someone buys your book in another country, it means you have to go there. <laughs> which means I have to travel. And so every time another country picks up the book, it's like, yay, and then, oh crap. <laughs> so I've learned now in the schedule of all of these amazing things I have to actually put in the morning, you know, yoga practice. I have to put in the evening massage or meditation or free time with my dog. You know, it has to be in the schedule for it to happen or it doesn't happen. Um, and I have to admit, the first time I heard about you, I was like, someone's so young being out there in the yoga world like this, and has she really earned it, and is she giving one-line hallmark messages, or is it coming from a deep place? And then I started looking in, and I could find nothing to pick holes. Like, you've done your work. You're not a young gymnast that just decided to tout yoga, um, but you've had a deep life, and you're way beyond your years, and even your yoga practice it didn't come easy to you. You didn't have an easy body to work with, and you just arduously um, learned your lessons, and now you are giving them to the world, and you have these girls and women that are following every word you say. Um, I guess my main question to you is how are you going to use that, that platform that you have? What is your main message? I think it's a, it's a really good question, and it's been something that's evolved throughout the past years. I, 
I didn't become a yoga teacher to, to gain fame. You know, it's, I feel like they're very contrasting ideas. So it was a, a big shock and kind of a, a whole new life to adjust to. Me and my, my husband were very private people. And now we walk down the street in New York and people left and right are like, hey, yoga girl. You know, they know our dog by, by name. It's, it's, it's crazy. But in the beginning, when all of this happened so very quickly, I, I didn't have a plan. You know, I just went with the flow of things. And all I wanted to do was was teach and have people come to class. So I was really, my first intuition was I don't want to use this to sell a bunch of stuff. And now, I mean, I could have probably made a million dollars selling a million pairs of yoga pants if I wanted to, but immediately I felt like there is, a, there is an opportunity to connect to a deeper level of, of, of people's consciousness, even through something so superficial like social media, right? And it's something that we see every day. Uh, young girls today, I feel, you know, wake up and the phone is here, and you go to bed and the phone is here. So what you see really affects how you feel about yourself and how you, how, what you manifest in your life and, and a lot about your self-worth. So for me, I have five young sisters, and it's been a, a big thing trying to empower young women and having people feel like it's okay to be the way you are. Which means for me, I have a really good life. Sometimes I have to pull back and be like, okay, what's been shitty today? A lot, you know? I have really crappy days just like everybody else and crappy moments and bad things that happen and really working on finding the courage to share that with as, as much depth as I can so that those young girls can feel like it's okay to have bad days too and it's not always picture perfect. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, I did read your book cover to cover. I couldn't put it, put it down. Um, you're very wise for your, I'm three decades older than you, I believe. <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> it's very true. And uh, I have three daughters at college right now. We have three daughters in college. And then they're very inspired by you on a daily basis. And in your book, you mentioned being drugged uh, three times. Luckily, it didn't turn into what it could have turned into. Um, but college rape is one in six girls right now, or sexual abuse. Um, I'm wondering if this is something that you can and will address. I mean, just knowing your self-worth is a big part of that. Um, as a mother of three daughters in college, it's one of my, my biggest fears. Um, and I, I think that you have the power and the platform to be able to really affect these young girls and, and women. Um, just one other thing I read in your book that you didn't go on to later on, but you just had one sentence that said, that's the first time my boyfriend hit me. Hmm. And then you didn't continue on with that in the book. And I guess I'm just wondering if um, that's something that you can address, because there's so much abuse of these young girls. And in some ways, I feel like their self-worth is not at the level that it should be. And they almost feel like, oh, this is the way it's supposed to be. This is what I deserve in a weird, weird sort of way. And then they're afraid to tell anyone about it because of the way society deals with issues like that. Um, no, I feel it's very, it's very true. If you follow me on Instagram yesterday, I shared a stupid selfie walking down the street just feeling just sharing, you deserve a good fucking life. If I can curse right now, I'm sorry. But that's what I wrote. And it, it was sparked from, I just, I receive a gazillion amounts of emails a day and I was just leaving the hotel and then a girl wrote me an email, a long, long, long email about how after reading my book, she sat down and had her first real meal in weeks. And just the idea for me to, to, to have that self-worth that is so low, that it's not automatic, right? That we feel that I deserve good things. I deserve a relationship where I'm cared for. I deserve a, a job where I'm fulfilled. I deserve to look in the mirror and feel like I like myself. You know, it's, it's a foreign idea. So sometimes the things that I write, they're very simple. You know, it's, it shouldn't be that complicated. But for young girls today, it really, really is. And I feel it doesn't so much... You know, it's, of course, it has to do with society, but a lot of it comes from us and from taking that first step into realizing that we do deserve a good life and that I am worth a lot. And, you know, we don't end up in those situations where we are taking advantage of if we really stand our ground and we, and we know what we deserve. And a lot of that, you know, it comes from having people to look up to and good inspirations out there. And I feel like right now there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of celebrities and 
Victoria's Secret models and all these people, I'm sure they have beautiful hearts, but it's really hard to inspire young girls to, to be themselves if everything is so unattainable. And I try to, to show all sides of that as much as I can, you know, but I'm 26 years old. I haven't, you know, lived a full life. I do my best. And uh, right now it's just reaching out to as many people as I can. That's beautiful and so needed. So thank you for inspiring my, my three daughters. Thank you. Um, how are you using, and you have a beautiful physical practice. Hello, handstands on the beach and full lotus sometimes, I've seen that. That is not easy to do, especially to learn as an adult. Um, how are you using this physical practice as a spiritual practice? Because I know that it that has a huge element of that for you. It does. And this practice didn't come easy to me. You know, my first, I found meditation first and breath work. That's how I started the, the path towards yoga. But I had so much back pain when I first started that I couldn't touch my toes, you know. Simple twists took a tremendous amount of effort for me. And my first years, even the, you know, the year before I went to teacher training, I, my husband would come home, or he was my boyfriend at the time, and I would be in a, in a puddle on the floor on my yoga mat, couldn't get up, and he would say, oh, did you try that triangle thing again? You know, triangle pose, which is kind of a basic pose if you do yoga, was my nemesis. Like, it, would, it was so hard for me to, to conquer that pose or to even find comfort in that pose. And that was, I don't know, six, five, six years ago, something like that. So it's not like, I, uh, like I'm a gymnast and all of this came easy, but I had to really take things step by step. And a lot of that was letting go of old tension that was, that was stuck in my body. And so much is emotional and really going deeper into the heart. And then the body follows, you know, I feel like... We can choose to go only the physical way and it's going to take us a long time or we can delve into the heart even though that's way more terrifying, you know, but the body will follow a little bit uh, quicker. So It's almost like the body is a road map for all of our stories, all of our past traumas. Do you feel like that? And then when you're in the yoga physical practice, you get to those deep places where we've maybe stored and buried things that the mind has forgotten about, but the body hasn't. I mean, how many times have you laid in Shavasana and wept? And you didn't even know why, right? <laughs> Almost every day. <laughs> I cry in everybody else's Shavasana. <laughs> Always, all the time. <laughs> I, I, we'll, be in, we'll be teaching and there'll be, you know, however many people in Shavasana. We can't bring them out because we're crying. <laughs> right? It happens a lot, yeah. And that's the best part of being a teacher, I feel, is that connection, you know. Right, you have this so ability and responsibility. Right, mm. to touch people in a really deep level. Um, and I think you're doing a beautiful job. I really do. We were in the green room talking about our similarities, which are uncanny. Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> I mean, I just wrote a yoga memoir, and that is hard work. Hard work. And you have a partner that stood by you when you were doing it. And that's hard work. To keep a relationship together... And I know that you're very married. Very married, yes, very married. As am I, and he travels with you and you work together, and um, that's not easy, that's, you know, to, to, to keep all of that, those balls juggling. Mm -hmm. um, and that brings me to my next question. I know he's a yogi as well, maybe more recently, and yeah. he's teaching? He is, he is. He, not as much. It's not his... Uh, the way I really found my, you know, this is my calling, this is it. He found the practice not through me. I nagged and nagged for years, and it just was not for him. And he needed to find a, a man teacher. That was really a big thing for him, you know. <laughs> yoga is not just for, uh, he thought yoga was a, was a hippie thing, because all he'd seen was traveling with me in S South and Central America and in jungles, and it's all, you know, all my friends have hemp clothing and, and granola, you know. <laughs> so for him to find a, a regular man who was just a proper regular person with a normal body, normal job, normal guy, um, with a really advanced practice, that was his inspiration. And he said, wow, okay. I want to go there. So he found the practice all on his own, which, which I really love because it's, it's, it's personal to him, you know. But when we do retreats, we, we co-teach, and he's definitely a... Uh, none of this would be remotely possible without him. <laughs> that was my next question. If you ever co-taught together, um, because that can be tricky navigating the classroom as well. As I know, I teach with my husband, Rodney. Ye all all over the world, and the first, and we've been doing it for 11, 12 years now, the first couple of years were hard, 
it's like, uh, you've talked a little too long, buddy, <laughs> and we're going to talk about it outside of this classroom. Or, you know, you both used to being front burner people, and there's that, there can be an ego clash even with yogis. Um, is that something that you've come up with or you plan to uh, further develop? Because we're looking for someone yeah. to pass that couple baton on to. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really fascinating. I think my husband, Dennis, he's really, uh, we're very much the same, but we're also very much opposite. So I'm very talkative and social, and he, he calls my classes very preachy. So I talk a lot, and I like to really go into the emotions of what we're doing. And he's very much the silent, straight-to-the-point type of guy. You know? So I feel like that mix is really nice. That creates a beautiful balance, yeah. I'm sure. I, I would love to to be part of that. I'd love to be uh, in the classroom oh, with you. We love your studio. We want to come back and teach there. It's so beautiful. It was amazing that you were at the studio. <laughs> I mean, I'm literally, we've been traveling in circles around each other. So it's so beautiful so to, nice. to meet you today. <laughs> um, let me see if I have anything else. Oh, I have a question for you. Do you ever feel like you don't want your personal life up for public consumption? Is there any times that you don't want to be yoga girl. Because the more I delved into you, and I did a lot of research on you, um, and you didn't become, you became Rachel to me. You didn't be, you weren't yoga girl anymore because there's such a real human being uh, behind this yoga girl image. Um, and I just wonder if there are times that you just want to be Rachel and you don't want to be yoga girl and you don't want your private life up for everybody to, to see? Because they wait every day. What's Rachel doing today? What's Rachel doing today? Did she have an argument with her husband today? Is she on TV today? You know? I know. It's a lot. In the, in the beginning, I used to, I, I didn't like that name at all. I thought, why did I choose that? It sounds so commercial and almost, you know, very, very unlike me. So every time someone said, oh, you're the yoga girl, I said, no, I'm Rachel. It's nice to meet you. Um, but I've kind of grown into it now, and I feel like it's, it is a way to reach people that I never would have on my own. You know, my dad told me, what if you were Rachel underscore Brethen XYZ 2008? You know, maybe that wouldn't have been so popular, really. And, and I feel through this brand, it represents more than, uh, than just me as a, as a person. But it is, it is exhausting. And I've had people come up, you know, in the middle of yoga class. I might be in a shavasana crying uh, with their phones. I'm just going to get a quick selfie here, you know. And I'm, I have a very hard time setting that boundary of saying no. So that's been something that I, it's a struggle, but also it's so overwhelmingly positive, you know? And you can see that even, even through social media, which can be such a nasty place sometimes. I have an overwhelmingly loving community there with me who are supporting each other and connecting everywhere in the world. And really, there's a lot of wisdom out there. And I feel what you give, you also get in return, so. Yeah, no, I totally agree. But there are, there are those moments of, I, I can see you're having a private time here, and I hate to, I don't want to interrupt you, but. but <laughs> right. All the time, that but, you know. And it's okay, like 99% of the time it's okay. And I chose to share a very personal side of myself as well, you know. So I really made that choice, which brings me closer to, to the people that follow me, and it makes everything more intimate and more real. Yeah, so, uh, that real, raw, vulnerable um, emotion. I mean, I, I tried to do the same thing, to be on my sleeve and completely transparent. And I think that's why I connected. I knew I was going to connect so deeply to you when I met you, and I, and I feel already that I have. Um, we're going to both start crying here. <laughs> I feel the same. Like, oh, God. No photos now. No, exactly. <laughs> Um, okay, I'll come back to something really simple. What's your favorite pose? <laughs> oh, my favorite pose. I love legs up the wall pose forever. It's a Different. pose that saved my back. And I, yeah, it's the one pose I do every day, no matter what, what's happening. That, that's my home. Vipri to Karani, it's a beautiful mm -hmm. pose. Another thing we have in common, I had back surgery. Mm -hmm. You've had a struggle with your back um, for most of your life, it sounds like. Um, okay. The, and I won't ask that one, <laughs> I will. The yamas and the niyamas, is there any one of those that you have taken and just really decided, okay, like um, nonviolence, like is this thought, is this action, is this word nonviolent, or satya, is this truthful? Because there's just such beautiful mantras, just to take one and go through the day and ask, um, am I following this, the yamas and the yamas, for those of you that don't know, are like 
I hate to say it, but sort of like the Ten Commandments. They're the observances and restraints that yogis try to adhere to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love, ever since I I found the practice, ahimsa has always been really something that I'm continuously drawn to, and not so much as in the, you know, nonviolence towards others, which is a very kind of obvious thing, but the nonviolence towards yourself, which is... Um, a much more difficult thing to, to adhere to, I feel. And sometimes, you know, we catch ourselves throughout our days, just the thoughts that we think and how we judge ourselves in everything we do and how that makes us, you know, smaller as opposed to giving us space to grow. And it, it really changes everything of, of, of what we create in life, you know, allowing ourselves to, to be proud of who we are and not just, you know, you know, someone tells you, oh, good job. No, 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 it wasn't me, it was someone else. Or, you look beautiful today. Oh, no, you do. You know, it's really hard to, to say thank you. I worked hard today. Or, thank you so much. I acknowledge that, you know. It's so true. It's so true. I taught a woman's retreat with 55 women. And we, I said, you know, what's the one thing you like the most about yourself? Not one of them could come up with something. Oh, God. <laughs> Is that so sad? Yeah. Or if there's something they say, oh, I, you know, caring for others or something like that, you know, we can always connect to. It's really hard to look at our own hearts and say, I rock, you know, yeah. and, and we all do in our own way. So I feel that, you know, nonviolence and just learning how to be kinder to ourselves mm-hmm. on a daily basis. Is, it, and it can change really the world around us as well. Yeah, I love uh, Mr. Iyengar says that you can only be as intimate with others as you are with yourself. And sometimes being intimate with yourself and having to sit with your stuff that's not very pretty and to dig through it and dig through it and dig through it is, is quite an arduous process. Um, but people can smell when you've done the work and that your words are coming from that place of that deep sense of intimacy. And I think when people see that, they relate to it and it gives them courage um, to be that intimate and to share that intimacy. And um, I think you're doing that, especially for these, these girls that are very impressionable and really look up to you. So I, I thank you for that. I didn't think that's what I was going to find mm-hmm. when I started doing the research. Um, and there's another that goes with you, the Marianne Williamson. It's our lightness, not our darkness that we're so afraid of. Like, who are we to be fabulous and wonderful? And it's almost like, who are you not to be? You owe it to the world, right? It's so true. Yeah. yeah. And I love how, how we, what we put out in the world, you know, gives others the, allows others to do the same. And I find that every time, even if it's something so, you know, Instagram can be, it can be very superficial and it can be very light and you can take it or leave it. But every time I share something that is, that isn't butterflies and rainbows, if it's a, you know, having a bad day or if it's cellulite or, you know, bad hair day or death or grief or loss, you know, heavy things. It allows others to share their own story. You know, it allows others to, 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 to decide, you know, to not put on that big smile today if that's not what you feel, but to actually be a little bit more true to what your life has brought you at that moment. And I feel it isn't a responsibility to keep that, you know, and to, to be human and to allow ourselves to be vulnerable and, and, and little when we need to so we can grow and spread our wings when we can. Um, I know that my physical practice and meditation and pranayama practice has gotten me through some great losses on the mat. Um, how do you think that has helped you? I know you've had some, some intense losses in your life and some struggles. And um, how do you think that the, the, the yoga practice has, has helped you get through that? I mean, I know it's helped me immensely. I had a big loss last year. My best friend passed away in a tragic accident. And... The first thing that happened was I had surgery the same day that she passed away and I couldn't move. So I had, you know, months of not being able to sustain a yoga practice. I couldn't roll out my mat, couldn't go to the bathroom on my own. It was really, really, you know, more than one loss, so to speak, as I couldn't continue that uh, salvation that I had on the mat always. And it was something that, that, I, that I learned at that time that, you know, yoga can also be a, an escape. Anything can be an escape if we make it, you know. So if you're having that horrible moment and you can either sit with it and feel it and let it, you know, burn and transform you, or you can run away and you can drink that bottle of wine, you can run away and eat a whole bag of chips, or you can run away to your downward facing dog and just close off that way too. And I feel yoga definitely saves me, but sometimes it's, it's almost like a, like, a, like a place to escape to as well. And using the practice in a way to sit and feel, you know, and not go too deeply into the flow of the vinyasa and the poses and the physical, 
um, but to let it be a place where you can cry, like we said, to feel, you know. To really steep in the loss. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, one of my favorite stories, there's an Indian guru whose son had died, and he had millions of followers, and this is similar to what, to what you're doing here. And every day the followers would show up, and he would sit there and just cry, and just cry. And about a week later, one of the, his disciples said, why are you crying? You're an enlightened guru. And he said, I'm crying because I'm very sad. There you go. You know, it's just <laughs> so real. Mm. And um, as yogis, I think that sometimes people think that we've gone beyond that somehow. And I think more than anything, it's really learning to be with that and to not push it away or cover it up, which I know both of us have a history of covering it up with substance. <laughs> and that's, that's not where it's at. It's really sitting, doing the work, and the work is, is beautiful and it's also ugly. It's true, yeah. Hmm. Um, so what's next for you? What do you, where do you see, I, 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 I actually <laughs> saw a video next? that you wanna have babies. I do wanna uh. have babies at some point. <laughs> we have to stop planning things and traveling everywhere first, I think, maybe. But I have this big tour now, so mm -hmm. when I'm done, it will be summer here in New York City, which feels very, very far away. <laughs> <laughs> and this is May. warm for us. This is not warm. This oh is my warm God. for us. No. <laughs> but end of May, I, I go back home to Aruba after this. It's a two-month tour. We're going all across the States. It's very, very exciting. But we're hoping to open our own studio on the island where we live, where there is, the community is very, very small. And Can I come teach a retreat there? Please do, <laughs> oh, we would love that. We would love that. The yogis on our island, you know, it's, it's a small community, but they soak up everything they can. Yeah, I mean, when you travel like this, you almost have to make yourself your home. Do you find that, like, you need to have that, that comfort, that familiarity, and you're not gonna have it in a different hotel room every night. Mm. Right? So to, to make your meditation practice and your uh, more internal practices your home, I think has to be the key, do you agree? It does, it has to be the key. I, I travel with my little, uh, I make a makeshift altar, always a corner in the hotel room where we are, and my sister is traveling with me now, and I was burning Palo Santo, my little Hollywood, and she said, are you crazy? The fire alarm <laughs> is gonna go off, like, stop it! <laughs> and I say, I need this now, you know, I need to feel that this is an anchor, you know, even, you know, in New York City, which is a wild place, but you can make it, you know, yeah. make your home where you go. You seem to be uh, thriving here in New York City. You, you, you pick up right with the energy and, and you go with it. Um, but I'm so happy you're going to take some time off after the tour because you will need it. I will. Um, yeah, there's, they're, they're telling us we're almost done, I think. Um, because, you know, people coming at you all the time can literally drain you, right? It can pull the life force out of you. Um, and it's interesting, I was told one time that I needed to put a shield around myself so that that couldn't happen. People tell me that all the time, yeah. And then finally somebody said, absolutely not. All you need to do is be clear so that mm. you can let it run through you. So then you can take it in and be compassionate rather than have it feel like it's bouncing. Mm. I know it's a little esoteric, but... But also not hold on, you know? Exactly. And, yeah, let it flow. So anyway, it's so amazing to chat with you. I'm, I'm honored, and um, I feel like you're my fourth daughter now. <laughs> I already have <laughs> one named so Rachel, much. but... <laughs> oh, no, you'll have two. <laughs> anyway, thank you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>
you know, you are who you are. And I feel like we can come to the mat with all of these, you know, ideas about this, this and that, whatever separates us from everybody else, right? And we can focus on what makes us different or what sets us, sets us apart, or we can see what makes us all, you know, human and what actually connects us. And I feel in the practice, especially in a, in a community practice in a room and we're all breathing together, moving together, we can actually feel that one beating heart, you know, all, all as one. And it takes, it takes a little bit of courage to go there, you know? And once we feel that, that look, what, look how much I have in common with all these people, whether or not they're women or men or old or young, or, you know, we all share that same longing to, to be happy, I feel. Do you agree? Anything? Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, men were slow to come to the practice in the States anyway. And I think the ones that do uh, are paving that path are incredibly brave. Um, it's, not, it's not as easy for men, usually, to go into that, that deep place. And initially, when I started teaching, there was 90% women and 10% men in the class. And that is changing rapidly. Uh, sometimes one of the hardest things for men is, what do you mean I have to take my shoes off? <laughs> I have to be on bare feet. And um, also, I know this is generalizing, but a lot of times I think men need to know they're already good at something uh, before they walk in the room or they're, I'm not flexible, I've been lifting weight so I can't do yoga. But once you get them into the room, I think that they can be, I know that they can be touched and transformed just as deeply as, as anybody else. Um, I know a lot of my daughter who's 19, a lot of her male friends started coming to yoga and it's uh, just so beautiful to see them get in touch with, with who they really are, with the depth of their being, and to be able to break down those, um, those barriers. So thank you for being one of the, the brave souls that are paving the way for other men. <laughs> Hi there. Thank you guys. Uh, it's very inspiring. And it's funny that you mentioned that just because I'm kind of new into yoga. So I was kind of wondering, you know, as a guy, I feel like it's more mental than physical, but I just wanted to know if there's any basic tips or, you know, information you guys had, you know, when you're doing these poses and keeping that strength you know, is there any tips or feedback you guys can give me so I can, like, try to get better at <laughs> yoga? I think you're doing it already. <laughs> I mean, you're inquiring and you started the practice, right? It's, that's why it's called a practice. We're never, ever finished. So even those times where you maybe come to the mat and it feels like, oh, my God, this is so hard and everybody else knows what they're doing and I'm the only one in the class. I have no idea. You know, everybody starts like that. Everyone, like even us, like everybody. I couldn't touch my toes when I started it. I felt like everybody was so advanced and so graceful and, you know, it's really about just sticking with it. And if you have a day where it's crap, then feel that. And let that be that day. And then you know, you know, a day sometime soon, you're going to walk out of that class feeling like Superman because, you know, that's how it transforms us. And then you'll go back to feeling like crap. And then you feel like Superman again. And that's how it flows. Yeah, it's fine to start with just a physical practice. And to let that, it, it will evolve into something more than that. But a lot of the reason people come to the mat is for the physical practice. Um, and... The physical practice, I mean, to be not flexible doesn't matter even one iota. Um, we have one of our main teachers named Richard Freeman, who's an amazing, uh, almost an alien. He has so much information in one lifetime, I don't know how he got it. But he came to us and he said, I just saw the most beautiful backbend I have ever seen in my entire life. And it was a 90-year-old man who was just standing up and just like, you know, it was just so even and, and so beautiful. So balance comes in many shapes, sizes, age, genders. Um, and, and that's what the practice is about, is, is finding that, that balance, that personal balance. So come to it physical. It's completely fine. It's completely fine. 
Hi there. My um, name is Katie. Huge fan, Rachel. Um, love that you share so much with such love and grace um, every day and find it really inspiring. Um, I do practice yoga pretty often, but just wondering, do you practice every day? Do you find that really important? Um, and if so, how do you find that motivation? Um, and is it okay for you to just do five minutes if it's not a full practice for an hour? Um, how you kind of fit that into your daily schedule? Yeah, I, uh, do you guys know the hashtag yoga every damn day? Yes. So no, not many people know this, but I started that hashtag years and years ago um, to inspire. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> it's, it has a life of its own now. Um, it was actually my husband. There's skate every damn day. He's a skater, skateboarder. And yeah, anyway. Um, and uh, there was lots of challenges out there, like in social media challenges in the beginning of the yoga on social media. You know, there was lots of advanced poses and people telling people through Instagram, do this pose today, this pose tomorrow, and this pose today, this pose tomorrow. And I started getting emails from people saying, you know, I injured myself. I was doing this headstand with no hands in my office and I hurt my neck. And I said, okay, well, you know, yoga is a great thing, but it's so much more than a pose. So I started that challenge. It was one month and anybody could join. And the idea was to practice yoga every damn day for one month. But yoga is so much more than the physical practice, right? So it doesn't mean that you have to come and take a vinyasa class 90 minutes every day, and that's exhausting. Seven, seven days a week, very, very few people can and feel good sustaining that. And that means for some people, we do five minutes of breath work before we go to bed, or you do 20 minutes of meditation, maybe some restorative yoga, and then three times a week, you take that power class, you know? But having the, the habit of rolling out your mat every day, and then whatever comes, just let that be okay. If it's five minutes, or an hour, you know? And then you feel like, you know, you are here. And with time, I feel like it will blossom from those five minutes. It turns into 10, and all of a sudden, you were there for 30, and you're like, wow, you know, this was a good moment. So, a little bit of routine, but whatever you can do, I feel, is, is good enough. You covered that one. <laughs> good. Hi, I have a very practical question. Um, here at AOL, we have beautiful office, but I too suffer from BRAC problems. I was wondering if you have any tips for things I can do at my desk or in my free time. Go ahead. Yeah, no, both of us. Good. I, I, just, uh, I just shared a blog on rachelbraithen.com on office yoga. I've been to so many offices this week. Everybody's corporate in New York. Everybody sits in front of their computers. And, and uh, it's been very, very popular this week, that blog. So just it has some stretches and some, some things you can do in front, of your, uh, in front of your desk. Yeah. Did you say you're having difficulty with breath? Oh. Oh, oh back, back problems. problems. Back okay. Problems. Yeah, there's a lot of texting backs and mm. texting necks and computer backs and necks. Um, I would recommend a couple of things. The Vipri Karani, the legs up the wall, mm -hmm. if you can sneak that in at any time in your day. Uh, another thing is a restorative back bend. It sounds um, antithetical, but it's, it's amazing. Just roll up a blanket, put it under your shoulder blades, and just uh, like that so you get more of an opening in the front body so that it is, I mean, we're all reversing our, our uh, cervical curves from going like this, and then there's no buoyancy to the spine anymore. Like we need all of those curves in our spine, and if we reverse them, then the back is gonna hurt because it doesn't absorb the shock, especially for a walking city like, like New York City. Uh, so to get those natural curves back with a restorative back bend, legs up the wall, is priceless. We have time for one more question. Hi, my name is Mia. I have a quick question for Rachel. Um, I'm also a casual practicer of yoga. It's really my girlfriend who has inspired me to try and be more consistent. She's a big fan of yours. And I was wondering if, um, if in your practice, in your experience, in your journey through yoga, what the importance of mentorship has been for you, if there has ever been a mentor figure. Sarah really is mine because she encourages me to practice as much as I can and that's the best way I also learn and I'm wondering if you have any figures in your life that have been that for you. Thank you. Yeah, I have and, and for me, my mentors have always come and gone. I feel like I have one in Colleen just after today. It's <laughs> It's crazy, but I feel like teachers are everywhere, you know, and we ask for them and they show up at the perfect time. So my mom has been a huge inspiration my whole life and 
not just because it's, you know, we have this great relationship and she's so strong and everything is awesome, but seeing her dealing with struggles has really inspired me, you know, to, to try to be as real as I can and to allow myself to be vulnerable as well. Uh, but my first ever uh, guru that I've ever had, I don't love that word, I, I really believe in the saying, be your own guru, but uh, Osho, was a, he's not alive anymore, but he was my main squeeze for a while. <laughs> But yeah, I really think so. And finding a mentor in your best friend. I mean, how wonderful is that? You know, that's amazing. That was one of my questions for you, too. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Thanks. That's it? Okay. Rachel, a pleasure. Uh, I'm sure we'll be connected for life at this point. <laughs> and uh, amazing to, to have this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you for the work you're doing. And go out and buy the book. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you.